B. Collins. Peter B. Collins, news and comment. It's Thursday, January 23rd, 2020. If I sound a little congested, I apologize. The cold that Santa brought me for Christmas has come back with a vengeance. And I chalk it up to uh, too much time in front of the boob tube watching impeachment hearings. And we will bring you our impeachment update a little bit later in the podcast. But in his effort to counter-program the proceedings in the Senate chambers on Capitol Hill, Trump has added to his bag of tricks. He launched the drone attack that assassinated General Soleimani of Iran. He staged the signing of the phase one deal with China, which is really just a photo opportunity. And today in his bag of tricks, he announced that the individual, the world leader, who prominently and publicly meddled in the 2016 American elections will be invited to an Oval Office visit. No, not Putin. Benjamin Netanyahu. That's right. Mike Pence was in Israel for the commemoration of the 75th anniversary of the liberation of Auschwitz. And he sidled up to Bibi and said, hey, why don't you come on over? Because after all, Trump is on trial. You're facing trial. You guys can commiserate and comfort each other victims of these uh, brutal investigations and witch hunts and hoaxes. So Bibi has uh, gratefully accepted anything to get out of Israel, and he will be in Washington while the Knesset is voting on whether to grant him immunity from the criminal charges that have been presented against this, uh, I believe, the longest-serving prime minister in Israeli history. Now, one surprise is that Mike Pence also saying that it was Netanyahu's suggestion, has invited his political opponent, retired General Benny Gantz, who has contested two elections with Netanyahu. They face a third coming up in just a month or two. And Benny Gantz is a Zionist through and through. And while he is not as corrupt as Netanyahu, my view is that he's not much better when it comes to the Palestinian issues. And what will these two Israeli rivals be doing? Well, they're going to hang out with Trump, and they're going to get a preview of Crown Prince Jared's Middle East peace plan. (laughs) Now, this has been promised since uh, almost day one of the installation of Trump. And we know that uh, they attempted last year to try to bribe Palestinians and their allies with a kind of economic booster proposal. But the Palestinians have not been participants in Crown Prince Jared's plan. He hasn't talked to them because they won't talk to him, because they don't believe that uh, the Trump White House will be an honest broker. So this is for show. It will buttress Trump's support from the evangelical base and some Americans who support Israel. And we know that this peace deal, if it works at all, or if it is implemented at all, will be a cram down on the Palestinians. They will be given no choice. And with his alliance with uh, Crown Prince MBS in Saudi Arabia, Jared believes that he has cut off the strongest support available to the Palestinians in the region. So they feel that the Palestinians are cornered and that you can put together some sort of a so-called peace plan just with the Israelis. (laughs) And as I describe it, I'm, I'm laughing because it's such a laughable concept. It's insulting, it's irrational, and it flies in the face of the history in the region. And a spokesman for the Fatah party, 
Mahmoud al-Alul, said that overtures from the Trump administration have grown more frequent in recent weeks, including at least 10 invitations to discuss the plan delivered by European intermediaries, and the Palestinians have rebuffed, uh, rebuffed them all. The Palestinian ambassador to Britain, Hussam Zamlat, Quote, our position is clear. Israel must end its occupation of Palestinian land that began in 1967, including East Jerusalem, and adjust resolution to the issue of refugees in accordance with international resolutions. Should such a deal be offered with the already rejected formulas, then steps will be taken by us to preserve and defend our rights, including holding Israel to full responsibility as an occupying power. So this is just a diversion, a distraction. Trump is running through his routines here, looking for ways to shore up his political base, to show that impeachment and the trial are of little consequence to him. It's business as usual, corruption as usual, uh, out the white, at the White House. The New York Times says that Netanyahu would be happy to shift the public conversation away from his indictment in three different corruption cases and push off a vote in the Knesset next week involving his request for immunity, which he is likely to lose. And they go on to say that uh, by extending the invitation to Benny Gantz, the Trump administration appears to be hedging its bets. The Times describes Gantz as a centrist and former Israeli Defense Forces general, that he had at first uh, argued for delaying the release of the Kushner peace plan until after the election, saying that it would interfere with domestic politics. But he recently reversed that position, uh, perhaps out of fear of retaliation from Trump down the road. And so, <laughs> as I mentioned, the idea that he is a centrist, he is a hardline Zionist, and he has applauded just about every attack on Gaza and the Palestinian encampments in the uh, West Bank as they have occurred. Now, here is a report that I've been saving for a couple of days. It was published on Tuesday. Benjamin Netanyahu is calling for sanctions on the International Criminal Court because it has the gall to launch war crimes investigations of Israel and its neighbors. This is not just focused on Israel. The investigation is also aimed at the Palestinians and some of their activist groups. But get this. Benjamin Netanyahu, who is working worldwide and has allies and complicit supporters here in the United States to shut down BDS, boycott, divestment, and sanctions aimed at Israel over its draconian and apartheid policies, Netanyahu is calling for sanctions on the ICC. So Israel can use sanctions in an underhanded way to try to evade a criminal court investigation of its brutal history. Sanctions are okay when Israel is the victim. But when we attempt to use our economic power, to support the victims of Israeli oppression. Their allies in the United States have passed laws, and I think South Dakota was the most recent, the 18th state, to sign laws that essentially carve out an exception to our First Amendment rights for oversized protection of the state of Israel against even political criticism. It's really disgusting. So the coronavirus outbreak in Wuhan, China, is uh, growing pretty exponentially. There are now about 500 cases. 17 people have died. And in advance of this weekend's Lunar New Year's holiday, when most uh, Chinese people will travel to visit friends and family, there's been a total shutdown of travel from the Wuhan region. And it's not limited to the city of Wuhan, but several neighboring cities. And the population affected is well into the millions. The restrictions will apply to tens of millions of people. 
and come as the Lunar New Year, New Year holiday uh, occurs this weekend. And uh, just a brief, what is the coronavirus? It's named for the spikes that protrude from their membranes resembling the sun's corona. They can infect both animals and people, call, cause illnesses of the respiratory tract, ranging from the common cold to severe conditions like SARS. And uh, that was the 2003 outbreak that killed nearly 800 people. But it's not a deadly virus that leads Donald Trump to expand his onerous travel ban. We called it the Muslim ban, and then they modified it a little bit. They added a couple of non-Muslim countries. The Supreme Court, using technicalities, failed to intervene to block this ugly and unconstitutional policy by Trump. And so now he announced in Switzerland at the Davos uh, Oligarchs Conference, we're adding a couple of countries to the travel ban. We have to be safe. And uh, according to people of, uh, who are familiar, the shithole countries that will be added to the uh, list of uh, people who can't travel to Fortress America include Belarus, Eritrea, Kyrgyzstan, Myanmar, Nigeria, Sudan, and Tanzania. That's not all. They've announced new visa rules targeting pregnant women traveling to the United States to give birth. Now, I recognize that some people game the constitutional uh, right that anyone born here is a citizen. But I believe you've got to amend the Constitution if you want to change that. But the Trump administration says applicants will be denied tourist visas if they are determined by consular officers to be coming to the U.S. primarily to give birth. But get this. Our laws prohibit the uh, immigration authorities from asking a woman if she is pregnant. So if you can't ask her if she's pregnant, can you ask her what her intentions are in coming to the United States while carrying a child? And there are a lot of women who, who don't show until the, you know, even seventh or eighth month. So this is another <laughs> effort to discriminate against, in this case, women who are pregnant. And this, of course, is pandering to the right-wing base of the Republican Party. They call them anchor babies. Trump has indicated his disgust with that element of our Constitution. It's in the way of this authoritarian would-be dictator to try to impose his policies on the United States. And here is the last of the immigration stories in my stack. But you already know that uh, they have brazenly upended the asylum policies and the guarantee of asylum that is in, in our Constitution. And we have these, these hoops and uh, barriers that are set up. If you're from Honduras, you've got to go to Guatemala, file papers, and then wait for your turn to have an asylum hearing. And so far, 55,000 non-Mexican individuals are forced to wait in Mexico as they hope for a turn before U.S. officials to press a claim of asylum based on immediate threats to their lives. And a new report from Human Rights First says that they found more than 800 cases of kidnapping, rape, torture, murder, and other violent crimes among those 55,000 people who are on hold indefinitely in Mexico. And now they are planning to force Brazilian asylum seekers to stay in Mexico. And apparently Trump doesn't care that people from Brazil speak Portuguese. And I have tried to learn a little Portuguese, but my limited Spanish gets in the way. Uh, they are difficult for, you know, native speakers to uh, learn the other language. So this is just another ruthless move of dubious legality 
being imposed by Trump primarily for political gain. Over at Guantanamo, the two consultants who netted $81 million from the CIA to devise a torture program that I believe was based on existing CIA programs. This was just a cover to avoid any uh, you know, forensic research into the torture practices of the CIA. So the irony is that James Mitchell, whose uh, colleague Bruce Jessen is with him at Guantanamo, he decided to testify in person at the trial of Khalid Sheikh Mohammed and the others accused of masterminding 9-11. The Intercept quotes Mitchell, I suspected from the beginning I would end up here. I did it for the victims and the families, but not for you, he said as he looked at one of the accused uh, uh, attackers. He added, you folks have been saying untrue and malicious things about me and Jessen for years. Well, (laughs) I'm not so sure about that. But it is ironic that the people who presided over the waterboarding of Khalid Sheikh Mohammed some 183 times are there in the same courtroom in this egregiously delayed trial that... (laughs) Well, the outcome is actually more certain than the outcome of the Trump impeachment trial underway in the Senate right now. And also, I want to credit Carol Rosenberg because I had no idea about this story that uh, occurred five years ago. And it's in the news because the former commander of Guantanamo, whose name is John Nettleton, a Navy helicopter pilot, who rose to run the remote gulag on the southeast coast of Cuba, well, he got involved in an affair with the wife of one of his subordinates. And she has admitted that uh, they had a sexual encounter or more. And one particular night, they were at the bar at Gitmo, and Captain Nettleton was schmoozing and uh, drinking heavily, with the woman in question, Laura Tour. And her husband was in the same bar. And he grew increasingly agitated watching the couple, (laughs) watching, (laughs) well, this is cuckolding. And later that evening, he went to Captain Nettleton's quarters. The captain had a house. And apparently he beat him unconscious. Because Nettleton says that, uh, well, he was kind of drunk, and uh, he woke up on the floor of his own house, and that's all he remembered. Well, a few days later, the former Marine, Christopher Turr, was found floating nearby. And Captain Nettleton last week was convicted of obstruction of justice for covering up the sequence of events when investigators came to call. So I just find this disgusting, sordid, and it's not a surprise that when you put people in a, an environment that is corrupt, that is fundamentally immoral, that violates American law and international treaties, that you don't get people who are the cream of the crop, you don't get people with high moral standards, You get people like Nettleton. Yesterday, we reported on Glenn Greenwald's fate in Brazil, where he is being charged with uh, aiding and abetting the hackers who leaked critical information to him that he published and that discredited the car wash investigation and the the Bolsonaro government's claims of being anti-corruption. And as Caitlin Johnstone writes today at Consortium News, she echoes comments I made yesterday that the prosecution of Greenwald on a hacking charge instead of some sort of a uh, leaking or journalism charge, it parallels precisely the way the U.S. is alleging that Julian Assange, the WikiLeaks publisher, tried to provide Chelsea Manning with advice and assistance in her, her effort to leak documents to WikiLeaks. 
And this is a way of getting around claims that they're persecuting reporters and violation, uh, violating freedom of the press. And I encourage you to read John Stone's piece. And over at, uh, this gets a little confusing, at Shadowproof, Kevin Gostola expands on our report yesterday about Consortium News filing libel claims against the Canadian spy agency and a television network, Global News. And this goes to Consortium News reporting on a woman, Christia Freeland, who is now Canada's deputy prime minister, and uh, they exposed uh, that she had covered up her grandfather's history. And she then blamed it on Russia, claiming that Bob Perry, the reporter at, and editor at uh, Consortium News who wrote the story before he died in 2018, that he was some sort of a Putin puppet, puppet and a Kremlin stooge. And Gostola writes, what the Canadian agency and Global News is uh, doing is much more alarming. They see the fact that they were highlighted in a security agency report as evidence of what happens when you challenge someone who's a very powerful woman in the Canadian government. And the current editor-in-chief at Consortium, Joe Laria, told Gostola, when you threaten the interests of these very powerful people, they will try to crush you in many different ways. One way is to smear you and to discredit in the eyes of the public as being ruled and directed from the Kremlin. This is as dirty as it gets, and it's authoritarian. It has no place in a democratic society that pretends to have a free press. Every night I hold my nose and I watch the public television news hour, which uh, has declined over the years. And one reason is that Jim Lehrer, who was one of the founding anchors, has died at the age of 85. He retired from the show in 2012, and uh, his replacement, uh, Judy Woodruff, is a very weak uh, anchor in comparison because Jim Lehrer was willing to ask tough questions and force his uh, guests to answer them. And Judy Woodruff is an apologist for the extreme uh, administrations that we've had, starting with the Bush administration. Uh, she was very timid during the Obama administration, and she is completely intimidated by the Trump administration. If you're a regular viewer like me, ask yourself the last time you saw an actual liberal or progressive appearing on the PBS NewsHour. I offer condolences to the family of Jim Lehrer. Every day I pause for a second to thank the people who support my work here at the Peter B. Collins podcast with your subscriptions. Great people like Chuck, Chuck Zlotkin, who just took out a new annual subscription. Thank you, Chuck. That was back in December. Also, John Morgan is a monthly subscriber, along with Judy Holloway and Carla Mahoney. I'm grateful for their support. I'd like to have yours, if I don't already. Visit PeterBCollins.com. Click on Menu. Click on Become a Subscriber. You'll land on the sign-up page, and you can take it from there. And before I get to my impeachment file for today, my report on yesterday's hearings in the United States Senate, I want to recommend to you my latest in-depth interview published today with uh, the scrappy investigative journalist Whitney Webb of Mint Press News. And as you know, I think that what she has confirmed here uh, and that I first reported about a week ago is that Trump's effort to intimidate, threaten, and bully the leader of Iraq, whose name is Adele Abdul Mahdi, is much more egregious, much more sinister, than what is being laid out in the obviously criminal Ukraine scheme. And Whitney Webb explains how the comments that the prime minister gave at a session of Iraq's parliament on January 5th not only asked the United States to pull its troops out of Iraq, not only stated that Soleimani had come on a kind of peace mission to Iraq, uh, Abdul Mahdi was brokering discussions between Iran and Saudi Arabia to try to reduce tensions in the region. That was reported by Max Blumenthal. And then we learned from an Italian reporter, and this tracks with the reporting of Whitney Webb, based on a translation of the Arabic transcript of the Iraqi parliament session and the comments of Abdul Mahdi, where he describes the pattern of threats from Trump 
Trump threatened that there would be protests and that uh, people would die. Those protests erupted just a week after Abdul Mahdi returned with a deal with uh, China to complete the reconstruction of Iraq for a mere 20 percent of the oil revenues, where Trump is demanding 50 percent. Here's an excerpt from my interview with Whitney Webb. And especially considering, you know, what what was alleged to have gone on with Trump and in all of this um, attempt to interfere with with Ukraine um, and all of that, the type of uh, thuggish behavior, what I call gangster diplomacy, um, you know, doesn't even compare, I think, to what the claims of Iraq's prime minister were in this situation. And basically, uh, to give a quick overview, a lot of this has to do, um, according to Iraq's prime minister, Abdul Mahdi, has to do with um, efforts at the U.S. to try and or by the Trump administration to get Iraq to agree to a very unfavorable deal or, or an exchange of oil revenue for reconstruction projects that would be completed by the U.S. Um, but what ended up happening is that because that was considered unfavorable by the prime minister, um, well, the offer that Trump had made, which was uh, that the U.S. wanted 50 percent of all of Iraq's oil revenue in exchange for completing reconstruction projects to which the U.S. had already committed, um, to do what had been dragging their feet on doing. Um, there was a counter offer that was made by China that was to do the same reconstruction projects, but in exchange for about 20 percent of Iraq's oil revenue. I encourage you to listen to the full interview with reporter Whitney Webb. It's available for my subscribers today at PeterBCollins.com, iTunes, TuneIn, Spreaker, and Stitcher. And I encourage you to share this all over the place. I think this is a very important story. And it's clear that uh, it's not going to get included in the impeachment uh, uh, trial that's underway now. But as I say, it is far more sinister than what is being alleged there. Now to my notes from uh, watching six hours of the eight and a half hours of hearings yesterday. My DVR didn't capture it all, but uh, I did my best to lumber through it. And I heard a lot of good arguments made by the Democrats. And they make artful use of video clips from the House inquiry in the Intelligence Committee and the testimony before the Judiciary Committee. And even if they don't get the deal on witnesses that's being dangled, they have a very strong case. And each time when they reference a John Bolton or documents that would buttress what Gordon Sondland testified to, they repeatedly say, would you like to see those documents? Would you like to hear these witnesses? Well, you can if you vote to do so. And it appears that the Republicans are still in lockstep. We're not getting any real signs of defections, only uh, proposals to talk about a deal on a pretty ugly witness swap, saying, well, we'll let you have these legitimate witnesses that would advance the testimony that you presented and the argument that you've presented if you allow us to blow up the whole process by bringing in Hunter or Joe Biden or both. And I fear that the Democrats will take the deal, that Joe Biden and Hunter will stink up the joint and create enough of a diversion that it lets the Republican senators off the hook for ignoring all of the evidence that has been painstakingly presented. Hakeem Jeffries did a pretty good job, accused Giuliani of being a cold-blooded political operative, noted that he had no standing with the U.S. government as he made these calls and contacts in Ukraine as the president's personal <laughs> enforcer. Uh... He did a good job of uh, pressuring the call for evidence, showing that the refusal to provide documents and witness, witnesses supports the criminal intent of the cover-up. He noted that there was no parallel legitimate investigation by the State Department, our Justice Department, or anybody else as Giuliani and his thuggish colleagues were uh, pursuing what he called a geopolitical shakedown. He also did a pretty good job of parsing the elements of the call memo. It's not a proven transcript of the July 25th call. And he went on to list uh, 10 or a dozen ways that it was far from a perfect call. 
So then Adam Schiff took over. He detailed the events of the month of August as Ukraine is desperate to get the release of the military aid, and it's repeatedly told through various parties aligned with Trump that you got to quid the pro and quo before we're going to release the money. He detailed the meeting that Pence took in Warsaw where John Bolton was present as they met with President Zelensky. The only thing I'm critical of is that uh, the Democrats omitted some key details related to the first so-called whistleblower because there are significant and credible allegations that that whistleblower was in contact with Adam Schiff or his committee staff before the whistleblower complaint surfaced in, uh, in or, on or about the 9th or 10th of September. So Lofgren, who I know a little bit, she's been uh, representing San Jose in Congress for many years. I thought she did a pretty good job of uh, detailing a sequence of events leading up to the lifting of Trump's hold and the common uh, response from most of the people who testified about this, that they still don't know why the hold was lifted. Only that in terms of time, it occurred two days after the White House publicly learned of the whistleblower complaint. And then Adam Schiff took over and talked about the whistleblower, and this is a mistake. He is not the best messenger because of the credible accusations that he had back-channel meetings, or his staff did, with the alleged whistleblower before it surfaced. But beyond that, I, I do think that despite, you know, I'm not really excited about Adam Schiff, but he did a good job of laying out the claims he introduced Lev Parnas and quoted from some of the public interviews that he has given. And so uh, despite the probable end game of this impeachment trial, my impression of the Democrats' first day of opening remarks is pretty positive. Oh, and Stephen Colbert, I caught up with one of his shows from earlier this week. He said that Rudy Giuliani is launching a new podcast called This American Low Life. <laughs> I thought that was a pretty good line. So uh, one of the things that's going on that we need to know about is that the before each session, the sergeant at arms says that the senators cannot leave and they cannot speak under penalty of being jailed. But Diane Feinstein went home early last night saying she was under the weather. We know that many senators have floated in and out of the chamber. And at one point, when, uh, who was it, the guy from Colorado, Jason Crow, noticed that senators were leaving the room for the adjacent cloakroom. And he looked at the chief justice and he said, well, uh, do people need to use the bathroom? Should I take a break? And the chief justice didn't enforce the rules and uh, just said, no, you proceed. And then Mitch McConnell said, well, we'll break for dinner in a while. And that was that. But, uh, you know, they should be following the rules. And it appears that their contempt exceeds even our impression of their contempt. And uh, here's a summary from The Guardian. Democrats aired dozens of video clips from previous, previous public testimony. The clips made for something of a greatest hits reel. Gordon Sondland saying there was a quid pro quo. Uh, diplomat David Holmes quoting Sondland that Trump doesn't give a shit about Ukraine. The former national security official Fiona Hill saying Sondland was being involved in a domestic political errand and we were being involved in national security policies and those two things had diverged. And Mick Mulvaney saying at the news conference that yes, there was a quid pro quo and we should all get over it. So the Democrats uh, uh, the session ran until about 10 p.m. Eastern time, and as they opened today, they had uh, 16 hours and 40-plus minutes remaining to press the case. The Republicans start their rebuttal. Their opening uh, uh, arguments will be occurring on Saturday. I don't believe there will be a session on Sunday, so that could carry over to Monday. But there's a lot of speculation that the Republicans won't use all their time because they're not really responding to the charges themselves. Uh, they're just trying to stink up the place. 
So Trump hit the Twitter machine on his way back from Switzerland, and The Guardian counted 131 tweets between midnight and about 5 p.m. Eastern uh, yesterday. Now, one of those tweets is being called into serious question because Trump accused Adam Schiff of lying. They used the official White House Twitter account, not Trump's personal one. Tweet. And you know Trump wrote this because lying is in all caps. Adam Schiff is lying that President Trump withheld an Oval Office meeting from President Zelensky. Trump invited Zelensky to the White House with no preconditions on three occasions, April 21, May 29, and July 25th. Well, the fact checkers at the Washington Post say, well, you know, the first problem is that the only meeting they had was at the United Nations, and that's not a White House meeting. And... When he met with Trump alongside the U.N. General Assembly, Zelensky, the comic, the the recovering comic, former comic, he got off this line. I want to thank you for invitation to Washington. You invited me, but I think, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, but I think you forgot to tell me the date. And in his airing out of the sequence of events, Adam Schiff did note the frequent contacts between Sondland and his counterparts in Ukraine and their increasing desperation and the increasingly blunt uh, linkage, the quid pro quo. If you want that military aid, you've got to call a news conference and say you're going to investigate the Bidens. And the Ukrainians were very clever. They kept saying, yeah, yeah, yeah. But they wouldn't hold the news conference until they had clarity that the aid would be released and a White House meeting was imminent. And neither occurred, and so they didn't follow through. So here is a quick uh, quote from some of Schiff's comments in April. Zelensky has this huge victory in the presidential election. He gets a congratulatory call from Trump. The president assigns Pence to go to the inauguration. May, Giuliani is rebuffed by Zelensky, cancels the trip to Ukraine, the one where he wanted to go, remember, meddle in the investigation. Then in May, Trump disinvites Pence to the inauguration. Pence is going. Giuliani is rebuffed. Pence ain't going. Uh, That's May. Instead, May 23rd, we have this meeting at the White House, and there's a new party in town, the Three Amigos. They're going to be handling the Ukraine portfolio, and they're told, work with Rudy. So... I think that while in many ways they're talking to a brick wall, the Democrats are laying out a clear record of these legal and uh, policy violations by Trump and his cronies. There is a new report just surfaced yesterday about how the sleazy relationship between the Trump Hotel in Washington and the Trump Inaugural Committee led to huge overpayments for the rental of facilities at the hotel by the nonprofit inaugural fund. And so Trump fleeced his own inauguration fund to shovel money into his own pocket at the Trump Hotel. They're saying that a, uh, an agreement to uh, use ballrooms and uh, conference rooms was billed at $1.03 million, even though the competitive rates were much, much lower than that. And finally, if there is this witness swap and one or more Bidens ends up testifying in this Senate trial, I think that it's not going to go well. And the New York Times reports on how voters on the campaign trail ask him about Ukraine, ask him about Burisma. And yesterday, he was asked if he would testify. He said, well, this is a constitutional issue. We're not going to turn it into a farce, into some kind of political theater. Now, during the holidays, he at one point said he wouldn't testify. Then he said if he's subpoenaed, he'd testify. But the Bidens don't have completely clean hands here. Despite all of the claims that they did nothing wrong, there's no evidence, the mere perception of Hunter Biden, who had no experience that qualified him to be appointed to the Burisma board, pulling down 50 grand a month, 
And Joe Biden is on videotape bragging about pressuring Ukraine to fire the uh, Attorney General uh, equivalent, Shokin, or Joe would withhold a billion dollars in aid. Any way you cut it, that's not going to play well. Stay tuned. We're going to keep following this right here. Thanks for listening to my daily news and comment podcast. I hope to have one for you tomorrow if I'm feeling okay. If not, check in Monday here at peterbcollins.com. Happy trails.